Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the June edition of 2022, the .NET DC lineup. I am Sean Colleen, joined tonight with a very special guest, John Galloway. John, it is great to have you with us. Thank you so much for being here. How are you doing tonight? Just kidding. I did that to freak you out. Ah, uh, see, man. Uh, I'm happy to be here. This I hope great. someone got a screen grab of my face when you did that. <laughs> this, this is after uh, what you didn't see behind the scenes is my my headphones died while we were testing John's audio. They disconnected, and so I was telling him he's muted. We're going through all this rigmarole, and it, it was just my headphones deciding to be fun with technology. Or was it? Or was it? Maybe I did at that time too. I'll oh, see. Now <laughs> this is going to haunt me for for yeah. days now. So, how, how are you doing, John? How are things in your neck of the woods? I'm good. Uh, it's funny. This I thought this was going to be a quiet month, and there's just a lot of a lot of back to back stuff going on. I'm excited about it. I got pulled into a um, learn live thing yesterday. Uh, with minimal APIs, um, there's just a lot of fun stuff. So, well, yeah. I think part of that is there's a lot of cool stuff going on in the ecosystem right now too. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to be getting into for the for the first time. That's actually one of the reasons I'm happy to, that you're doing the, the, the talk that you're doing tonight is because I think that there's there's a lot of stuff that folks who you know you blink and you miss some things sometimes in, in this ecosystem. It's moving a lot faster than it used to, and I and I personally love that. But yeah, it's good good to stop and, and catch up on some of the the new hotness, as it were. Yeah, you know, part of what I'm hoping to do, because I feel like we do a little too much of that. Like, we'll say, like, um, hey, .NET 6 is coming, .NET 6 is coming, .NET 6 drops. Hey, .NET 7 is coming, .NET 7 And we don't really talk about what you can use today. So I'm trying to, as part of my talk today, emphasize some of that, you know, like there's, it's good to, to keep an eye on what's coming, but also probably more important real world, what you can use today. 
So uh, absolutely. And you know, I saw some comments in the chat. I saw Neil saying, "Hey, we got some folks from outside the DC area, which is awesome." And I was hoping too, John, that, that you would open up our audience a little bit there. So I've actually got a poll up right now for those who are interested. We've got a poll up there. I've got this uh, poll everywhere account. I I don't have the fancy username for it, but if you go to Sean K four three one at pollev.com, you can actually tell us a little bit about where you're viewing from. So I'd love to love to see a little bit more about that and see where see where you're viewing from for everyone who's joining us. Uh, but regardless of where you're from, we are we're happy to have you here. Uh, and regardless of whether you're you're near the DC area or not, it's it's great to great to have you. John, you're in where where are you on the West Coast? You're in I am in San Diego. Okay. Oh. Oh. For, I, yeah. for some, I thought Seattle, and I was like, "No, you're you're too you're too late back for Seattle." It's a, yeah, it's a good guess, but no, I'm I'm San Diego, so yeah. You're not you're Actually, not hanging out with Hanselman and Weird Portland. You're you're right, you're right, hanging on yeah. San Diego. <laughs> nice. So we've we've had I don't know the weather's been okay for you there. We've had a couple of very um, like the temperatures been nice, but it's like DC is a swamp. So we've had just uh, some uh, some humid some humid mess lately. Uh, the the last couple of days have been all right. How how are things for you out there? I don't want to jinx things, but we've had a pretty mild spring and beginning of summer here. It's it's um you know like high seventies, low eighties Fahrenheit, you know. So yeah, gotcha. We're yeah. sort of waiting for the waiting for the other weather shoe to drop. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. So you know, I'm I'm interested in folks. Uh, I'm interested in folks having the. Uh, you know, understanding where folks folks are from here, but I'm also I've got another poll. That I'm going to try and see if I can throw up here my polling screen has just disappeared all right we should be able to do this i'll i'm sharing my screen but i'll go ahead and you can see the behind the scenes here so let's i'm also interested into what you know we talked about um what do you want what do you want to learn more about there's a lot of stuff that folks are catching up on so mm. let's go ahead and run that poll too i'm curious as to what folks are thinking so again if you go uh to that poll ev.com slash sean k431 tell us a little bit about what kind of things you want to learn more about in the world of dotnet and i mentioned that mostly because one i'm selfish and i want to know what topics we should do for dotnet yeah. dc and the kind of things that you're looking for as a, as an audience and also i'm sure that uh, folks like john are probably interested in terms of figuring out what what folks might be catching up on or, or what you know what the, this cross section of developers might be interested in, so uh, definitely feel free to, to respond over there, and I will show those results here as well. Um, so, John, you know, I was say, what, when was the last time you actually visited DC? Have you been here before? I realized I don't, I don't know if, if we talked about that before. Yeah, actually, I have. So, I um, a billion years ago, I went to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, and then more recently, right. my um, yeah, my younger brother is a professor there. And so I, I got to go out to a reunion and a, um, um, and I got to go hang out at my brother's house this past October. So that was pretty fun. Um, so, and, and just this summer, he's now on a sabbatical here in San Diego. So I get to hang out with him, but oh, very he, nice. He got, he got the brains of the family. He's a double E professor doing doctorate. He's, he's a doctorate in double E and he's doing stuff with swarms of, drones and all kinds of crazy stuff i don't oh, i don't really understand cool. it i just hope he's nice to us you know so. <laughs> sure <laughs> always the kind of thing that's fun to watch if a little disconcerting to watch yeah exactly uh, yeah um you know and i um you, you have done you know i know i want to make sure we have enough space for your presentation i want to pepper you with questions but one thing <laughs> you know you have done a ton of stuff in in the in the dot net world but of course you have a background way outside of that as well and i was wondering you know what sort of things from your non-developer life have you applied to your developer life i'm sure that could be a talk unto itself but you know oh, i'm always yeah. curious and i always try to ask folks when you know something quirky when they come on so you know what what kind of things from outside of your developer life do you find help you to be a better developer hmm. okay a big thing that's coming to mind for me is just communication in general and a lot of what i do at microsoft really is communication focus like I'm I'm a nerd. I love to program, but a lot of what I end up doing is trying to learn something and then explain what I just learned. Or you know, and sometimes I'll yeah. do that, and then you know, I'll find out I was slightly wrong, and I'll keep improving as part of that. Um, one thing that's been interesting to me, actually, I, so I mentioned earlier, I went to the Naval Academy a long time ago. I really am not the most military person. You know, you probably wouldn't even expect I, I was I'd done that. Um, but recently, Microsoft has a military mentoring program, 
and I've gotten involved with that. And as part of that, I am helping mentor people leaving the military and getting into tech careers. And so part of what I've been doing is coaching people on how to interview and how to learn technology. And it's really interesting to me how, how many, um, how so many things come down to just communication. And so like, for instance, as I'm coaching them through interviewing, we'll ask them a question and they'll say, I don't know that. And I'll say, okay, that's the military correct answer, but that's not going to get you hired. What you want to say is, you know, and then talk about what you do know. Like, so talk about what your experiences are, and you know, so, so that's been really a thing that I think is kind of a common thread for me is I just love communication and, and, um, and, you know, how, how do we, how do we as humans like interact and talk to each other and stuff? So sure. I, I feel like that's something that's universal. Definitely with technology is a problem. I feel like it's very, you know, very common that t documentation is technically correct and totally useless, <laughs> and yes. you know, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I really try, and I, and I fail at this constantly, but I try and focus on communicating <laughs> as part of all of that. Well, I, I think failing, failing constantly is the, the key to improving constantly in, in a way, yeah. right? So I think that the, you know, I, I, I've always loved that. When I started streaming, I was fascinated, and I don't stream a ton, but when I first started doing it, I was fascinated by the way that folks interacted. And it was like it opened up this whole new understanding for me of how people take in certain kinds of information and learn things and how we have to adapt our communication styles mm -hmm. to to folks, like asynchronous communication or, or you yeah. know, different different variations of that. Certainly in this kind of remote world, streaming and async has been the, a big shift for, for so many folks. I think you're totally right. It's all about learning. learning yeah. Better, and, you know, you know the different stuff. communication styles is so important. Adapting, adapting your communication style to the person you're talking to. So like I want to, you know, continue to use my strengths, but I also want to, if I communicate the way I communicate to someone who doesn't communicate that way, it's a waste of time for everyone. <laughs> So yeah, absolutely. So we've got some we have some results coming in on the on the poll here of the you know what do you want to learn more about? F sharp is on the list. Now we don't have a ton of people clocking in yet with, with votes, but I have to yeah. say I would add my vote to F sharp as well. You know, I, I tinker around with it as much as I can. I haven't gotten to use it in a real project yet, but that's that's on me at this point. Um, I've modeled some pretty cool things with it and I, I, I enjoy the terseness of it uh, for yeah. sure. So I, I think I think I'm not alone with that. Source generators also getting a vote and generating TypeScript from Types, which I think there's some there's some libraries out there for doing that. Was that was it? Am I Avalonia? Was that it? Or am I am I? So Avalonia, right? wait, Avalonia is different. That's that is a um, a UI thing, right. Um, right? Yeah. So source generator, super interesting. Um, and I really have I have not messed with them enough. I'm super like I'm excited whenever I see them being used, but I haven't gotten to just sit down and write my own. Um, yes. But F Sharp, definitely something that I think is really cool. I've done several getting started tutorials. I played with like Saturn and some of the, the web frameworks around, uh, around F Sharp and I really like them. And I also, to be honest, a lot of my favorite recent features in C Sharp have, have been you know, learned from F Sharp. That's true. Yeah. You have to try to cross the crossover that's trying to happen with records and with some of the other the constructs there around the nullability mm -hmm. and, and bringing the you know, null checks and, and so on and so forth. And I do, yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of good stuff we can get from that ecosystem. And just look at you, just saying that got another vote for source generators as well. So, <laughs> um, so you're, you're shifting you're shifting the results here, Gal. Yeah, there you um, go. So, so let's, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, I don't want to waste, you know, waste too much of your time or spend too much more of your time on chit chat. So we'll kick it off here um, with that. But folks can feel free to keep responding to that poll in the meantime. Um, so this is the .NET DC June 2022 meeting. Uh, sponsored by Excella. Excella provides the, the StreamYard license and provides me the time to do this. So hey, thanks Excella for that. Very cool of you. Um, we also are sponsored by Manning, uh, which gives the .NET DC user group a 30% off code. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to use that code. It's UG367 in case the text is a little small there. Um, I checked it recently and it worked. So definitely if it doesn't, let me know, but it should, should still be active and, and kick in there. 
Um, so feel free to put any announcements in the chat. Now, we'd love to have you in a Zoom meeting and have everyone be able to speak up. And that's one of the, the trade-offs we make with streaming is that we lose some of that. But I do encourage you, if you've got coming events or if you're hiring or looking to be hired, um, if you've got anything else you want the group to know, drop that in the chat. And I'm happy to, to summarize that at the end or figure out a way to feature that. And also want folks to know that we have uh, online open governance at github.com slash dc.net. There's an open governance repository. We've got some discussions going there. If you want to speak to the group or you'd like to see a certain topic or just you got something on your mind and you want to talk about it, feel free to bring that up at the dc.net group there as well. We also do all of our planning for our events there. So we've got a GitHub you know, issue for each event. We have a big checklist. If you're curious about all the stuff we do behind the scenes to set up for one of these events, that's all open there as well. So feel free to, to reach out and do that. Uh, we'd love to, love to see you participate there as well. If, if I can, just a second, if you can go back two slides the, the, in the Manning thing, mm -hmm. one thing I just have to have to give a shout out. There's uh, Andrew Locke has this ASP.NET Core in action, and I, I, I'm a huge fan of Andrew's stuff just in general. He writes tons of really great blog posts, and then there's more of it in, in the book. So. If you're seeing this, you're like, well, I don't know what to get there. I would start with that because I'm I'm a fan there. <laughs> that's a that's a great. Uh, so I'll put that in the chat here. John's recommended book. And I'm here, sure there's other ones that are slipping my mind, but that is a top a top pick there. Yeah. So there we go. I've got that got that in the chat here as well. All right. So given that, then that's a that's a good note though. It's good. Uh, Andrew does a ton of good stuff. He's a fantastic resource for the community. So for sure. Um, and so, of course, got to mention the .NET Foundation, something I think you're a little familiar with yeah. as well there yourself, John, uh, you know, a little bit of experience there. Um, so the .NET Foundation, for those of you who aren't John and maybe less aware about the .NET Foundation, is uh, the .NET Foundation is a, an independent uh, nonprofit uh, that seeks to uh, guess, enable uh, open source within the Microsoft community and, and the .NET community. And so uh, you there are a lot of fantastic projects that belong to the .NET Foundation. Um, you know, there's a lot of you know, really important, I think, passionate discussions going on now about the role the foundation plays in the community and the role that open source plays in the community and how those two things interact in, in our current world and our current context. So if you're interested in that or you'd like to help out or jump into a project, there's so much there that uh, that we could benefit from your your support and your your involvement. So get involved if you're if you're at all interested. Check it out at .NET Foundation. Org. And certainly, you know, I'm, I'm on the periphery of several things in the .NET Foundation. I'm a big fan um, of, of a lot of what they're doing. And, and so really, um, if you have any questions, feel free to talk to me. But certainly, the community like that can always benefit from your voice. So I would love to, would love to see you there. And one of the things the .NET Foundation does, which we'd be remiss to, to forget here, is that we provides the .NET Foundation virtual user group. If you haven't seen this, this is actually a meetup group on uh, a group on Meetup that uh, is an amalgamation of the uh, all the different you know virtual meetups that it can be submitted. So .NET DC, there's a form we can submit, and then we uh, it puts all the meetups in one place. It's a really nice way to kind of keep a, an eye on what's coming up and stay connected to different local user groups and events as they happen across the community. So really cool thing the .NET Foundation provides. Yeah, just to, to, like, so I, I work on James Montemagno's team and this was a cool opportunity he saw right at the beginning of the pandemic when all the, the meetups were having to do these virtual events. And then it was kind of like, well, if you can do a virtual event, why can't anyone attend? And so that's exactly like you're saying, it's an, an amalgamation. So, you know, a lot of meetups can just, any meetup can just submit their thing and say like, come, you know, to this one. There've been some, um, some meetups that are in, you know, like smaller cities and have really grown as part of this. So it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. It's a really, yeah, it's a really nice uh, thing that, that the foundation offers. So definitely check that out, subscribe to those updates and certainly we'll keep posting our events there so you can see us there as well. So about John, John, the man of the hour, uh, it's really, uh, it's fantastic to have John here with us. John is a program manager on the .NET team at Microsoft. And uh, I really just put the rest of the slide that if, if you know, you know. John has written books. He has uh, worked with the coding, uh, the uh, Herding Code pro podcast for what, 10 years now. Um, you, he, he's been uh, the, the the leader of the .NET Foundation. He's you know done a ton of stuff. He's been writing software since the 90s, and, and we're really, really happy to have you here with us today, John. So many, many folks in the .NET community are already familiar with who you are, so I won't spend too much more time uh, introducing. Is there anything we should know about you that isn't standard or that, that, that we may not already know about you? 
Gosh, uh, nah, nothing comes, you know, like, uh, I guess one other thing that I'm excited about lately, and probably people have seen this, but the, the um, .NET Live TV. So on the .NET website, we have the .NET Community Standup. And so I, I host the ASP.NET one, but we have a lot of other great ones on things like Maui and tooling and, you know, all kinds of other stuff, too. So that's that's something I've been working on lately, too. That's, that's awesome. And I'm going to put that uh, link here in the chat as well for folks. So uh, thank, thank you again, John, for, for being here. I appreciate it. You know, I've already spent too much time yapping away and we'll we'll let you get into it because there's so much new stuff to talk about in ASP.NET for, with .NET 6 and 7. And so uh, I think without further ado, I'll turn it over to you and, and feel free to take it away. Sounds great. Okay, yeah, we can uh, we can share my screen and I'll, I'll just dig right in. Yeah, so what I'm going to try and do in this is I'll, I'll go, I'm using some, some Microsoft slides. Um, I am also kind of giving you my interpretation of it. So this is how I fit all the stuff in ASP.NET into my head. I'm going to do my best to talk about both what's in .NET 6 that shipped now and what's coming in .NET 7. And I will try and be very clear about what's what's you know shipped and what's not. Um, I like to think of ASP.NET as just your toolkit for building anything for the web in .NET. So you've got two different areas that you build things for the web. You've got services, so that's all the stuff going on on servers, behind the scenes. You've got your APIs. Sorry about the slide there. <laughs> I made it a little hard to organize. Um, so you've got all your services that are you know, supporting your, uh, your front ends. You've got your APIs, SignalR. You've got workers, gRPC, et cetera. Um, and then on your front end, you've got a variety of things you can build there too. You can build more server focused uh, applications. So like MVC and Razor pages, those are the code is mostly executing on the server and, um, and you know, rendering out to the browser. And then you've got your more client focused for building applications. So I like to think of them as websites versus web apps. It's everything's very blurry on, the, on what you build on the web, but so your websites are the MVC and Razor pages, and then your very client-focused applications or spa, uh, spas like React and Angular, and then Blazor as well. So I mentioned, you know, you've got this whole stack. Uh, you've actually got a, a whole bunch of supporting services that do that. So all those little boxes that I had, those are the ones up on the top here. And then you've got all these other things that go on to support that. Um, you know, you've got, you know, your servers, your hosting layer, your um, your cross-cutting things like logging, configuration, et cetera, and you've got all your middleware. So a ton of great stuff. I saw earlier on the chat, we, uh, Sebastian Ross was was on. He does a ton of work on a lot of this stuff, supporting um, supporting uh, the, these kind of services that make ASP.NET work across all of these layers. So, um, so what I'm going to do, and again, I'm talking about how I fit this stuff in my head, so hopefully this works for you. I'm going to start with the bottom parts of this. I'm going to talk about the services, the middleware, et cetera, what's new and what's on the way in uh, in ASP.NET. And then we'll talk about, uh, excuse me, so we're, we're talking about the base things. Then we'll talk services like uh, APIs and gRPC. And then we'll talk about the web front end stuff. And I'm partly doing that because the web front end stuff is where I feel totally at home. And it's also the shiny stuff. And so that's a great place for me to end up if I, if I start running out of steam towards the end. So, all right. So let's go with, first of all, the schedule. Um, so we shipped uh, .NET 6 in November. And hopefully everyone's kind of used to this by now. We, we are on a cadence of shipping every November. And uh, for some people, they think that's terrible. It's way too much. You're overloading me. The idea, remember, is that the web and development world moves very quickly now. And things, you know, there's probably three new JavaScript libraries have launched since this talk started. Um, there's new security exploits, browsers are shipping every 15 minutes. And so we really, uh, in order to service all the new things, in order to expose uh, all the right things and fix all the security issues, uh, you know, exploits that haven't been invented yet, et cetera, we need to ship very regularly. So. We are on a cadence of shipping, you know, previews through the year, uh, uh, release every November, and then moving right on to the next one. Now, this is stuff that's available to you. It shouldn't worry you though, because the idea is that you um, you can use an LTS release, and that's supported until the next LTS. 
Um, and so that, that gives you kind of a, a longer period of time. We also are doing a lot of work in order to make it easy to update from each version to the next. So if you got burned by earlier versions of .NET Core, um, we really do have things, and, and that's a, a design goal as we, as we build .NET to make it so that it's easy to update from one version to the next. As part of that, I'll be showing some new features. You don't have to use any of those new features. So um, you can very easily just say, I'm going to um, update my, my version number, and now you're running on .NET 6, and, and you're good. Um, so, so that's generally the idea. And yes, I, uh, as Sean pointed out, that should be spelled on this. LTS is long-term support, and that is, uh, that's a release that is supported long-term. And that's, th this is very much modeled after, uh, you know, like you, you're seeing this on most other frameworks, especially those that, that uh, support the web, like uh, Node and NPM. You're seeing it also in like, uh, you know, like uh, Ubuntu and other uh, operating systems, et cetera. So even, even Windows, you know, ships pretty often now. So, so anyways, this is the general schedule. So we uh, shipped uh, .NET 6 in November, and now uh, we shipped uh, uh, .NET MAUI very recently. So that's cool. And then the next big thing on the horizon is .NET 7. Um, let me show you too, as I am about to get into that, let me show you one of the ways that I keep up with all this stuff. So this is this website, themesof.net. This site is actually, you know, we dog food our own stuff. This is built in Blazor. And you can go through and you can click on this and you can see what's in the roadmap. Um, this is going all the way out to, you know, like .NET 9, but you can see, okay, what was in .NET 6? And you can see this really pretty chart. If I go in and I expand out like an application model um, and I've probably screwed things up. Oh, it's because they're all shipped. Um, if I go into .NET 7, hopefully, I'm not sure what I'm doing around here. Um, normally, there it is. So that's the idea. You can go in and you can see what's in .NET 6, what's in .NET 7, and you can see all the stuff. I'm only speaking for an hour-ish, and so there's no way I'm going to cover all of this. And so I'm talking about the things that are most exciting to me. And in general, when you look at things like our blog posts, We'll also do that. We'll get some bullet items. We'll, you know, put them in the tweets and stuff. Uh, but there's a ton of other features that are coming out, and so, you know, just by that nature, you're going to see things that are. We're going to give you. Um, we try and group things into themes, and then we also just do a lot of other small fixes or improvements along the way. So, so this is kind of the place to keep up with things as. Uh, another neat thing with this is you can go in and say, so for instance, .NET 7 MVC enhancements. So you can go in through here and you can actually, these there are issues in here and some of these are epics. So this one is a very specific issue and you can watch as the team's commenting on it, as the code's checked in, you can see the source diffs, et cetera. So .NET is is an open source project. It's developed in the open, and it's something where you can uh, you can get involved in. There are some of these here where you might say, you know, delivering on the remaining .NET Core customer promises of .NET 5. Well, this is .NET 7. But then when you dig into this, you can actually go through and you can see some of these things are like streaming API support in MVC, et cetera. And, and honestly, we're shipping every year. There are some things that are not going to make a cut for one year, and they move on to the next. There are other things that ship as experimental that then move on to becoming, uh, you know, the default in a future version. So, so these are this is kind of the high level where I keep track of things. All right, let's go back to uh, the high level stuff of what we shipped in .NET six. So uh, one of the things is minimal APIs. And I'll, I'll dig into that in a second. The general idea of just making it easier to write an application without having to write tons of boilerplate code. Um, so really focusing on code that means something and less the code that you just have to write to get your application started. Uh, .NET Hot Reload. So this is across the board for a lot of different workloads, but definitely in web dev. There are some things that will work with Hot Reload and some things that won't. And then it'll give you a warning. It'll say this, this uh, will cause a root edit, and it'll restart your application uh, if, you, if you tell it you want to do that. 
Uh, but in general, especially with web dev, this can really save a lot of time because you're able to iteratively develop and, uh, and work with your application as you make changes. There's a big difference in this in hot reload between hot restart. So let's imagine I'm working on an application, I'm filling in a form, I'm doing form validation, and I realize maybe something in my form validation is incorrect. So, and I've logged into the site, I've done all this stuff to get there, right? So with hot restart, uh, my application still restarts and I have to log in again, I have to go through and fill out the form again, I have to recreate that state. With hot reload, it's able to inject the change code into your running application and keep the application running, keep your state there. So in a lot of cases, that can be very significant in terms of you know just cutting down that repetitive work uh, as, as you're developing. Uh, in general, every, every release we focus on performance and memory usage. Um, so that's, that's you know, a very important thing there. Um, one thing that I don't see um, people talking about as much as I would expect is the integration with front end JavaScript frameworks. So these are frameworks like React and Angular and the whole hosting model has changed around in, in this release. And I, I feel like that's um, that's a relatively big deal. I'm curious in in chat, you know, how many people are building applications with ASP.NET Core on the back end, and then React or Angular, especially on the front end, um, or other uh, you know JavaScript focused frameworks. Um, and, and like I said, yeah. I can definitely raise my hand on that. I'm doing that right now. I'm doing .NET. I'm doing uh, .NET uh, six web APIs and uh, and a React and an Angular application. Some of the client work I'm doing now. When you've when you've done that, um, have you? Honestly, I found that up until .NET six, I felt like the integration was not super smooth. Um, the way that ASP.NET integrates with React and Angular is kind of a little sketchy. <laughs> I don't know. There, there 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 could be some friction when you're when you're first getting started, and some of the stuff that you feel like you know maybe you would love to have out of the box or easy to configure. And I think it's gone a long way with some of the with some of the, the startup and the improvements of how we how we add different libraries and integrations to its web API or to the API itself. Uh, but I think that you know yeah there's 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 some friction there that uh, that can be harder, especially when you're trying to get started to get something working quickly, you know, do that kind of minimal time to impact for that we that we focus on in modern software delivery. So I think you're right that there's been there's been some pain, but it gets it's getting better all the time. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right, yeah, so I'll, I'll dig into that a bit. And then changes with um, client UI with .NET and Blazor. So I will talk to Blazor a little bit. Blazor is a huge thing. Um, there, is, there is a lot of stuff going on in Blazor. And so I will talk at a high level about Blazor, but I'm not a super Blazor expert and I don't have the time to even if I was. So <laughs> I'm, I'm mostly gonna talk about how I'm thinking about Blazor um, in recent releases and going forward. So. .NET 7, these are the kind of, you know, high level things. Uh, so there's work on performance as always. Uh, HTTP 3 was actually shipped in preview with .NET 6 and moving to the default in .NET 7. You may think HTTP 3, didn't we just get HTTP 2? And really HTTP 3 is a more um, incremental update on HTTP 2, which fixes this kind of um, head of line blocking issue. Um, HTTP 1 is very much like request response based. HTTP 2 focuses on these kind of longer running connections and multiple uh, things streamed as part of a connection. However, you can get in, in, into an issue with that where one thing can be slow and it can block everything else. And so HTTP 3 fixes that. Um, minimal APIs, um, uh, minimal APIs fix, or uh, well, we'll dig into that more. But um, in .NET 6, we shipped the first version of minimal APIs. As always, when Microsoft ships the version one, it works, but there's then people start using it. We start using it and we say, oh, you know, we really wish it did this and this. So there's a lot of stuff on the way in .NET 7 that will kind of improve the, the actual development experience. So some of these are things like, so you've got uh, endpoint filters, route grouping, um, simplified authentication, et cetera. So uh, it's very easy to write hello world in, in minimal APIs now, and .NET 7 will help you actually write something more useful. 
um, gRPC transcoding. Very easy way to, um, yeah, and as Niels calls out, more model binding, which is awesome. There's a ton of stuff there. And also what's really cool is there's this really cool interaction as minimal APIs brings some things in. There's actually a lot of these things are also coming into MVC and uh, API controllers as well. So there's some additional things that are also being added for model binding with MVC as well. Uh, gRPC transcoding, pretty cool. The idea there is uh, gRPC by default is using binary with protopuff and HTTP2. That's super performant um, and it's great for clients that can talk with all those things. Um, however, there you do run into cases where you can't. Um, there may be an example where in your data center you've got everything can speak HTTP2 except this one old server, or there's one proxy that just can't do it, or you're integrating with a client that just doesn't, uh, that you can't connect to. Additionally, developing in a browser is not super great. Uh, browsers don't speak all these things. And so in the cases where you would normally, you know, just go in and start curling things and, and integrating, there are tools for it, but it's not quite as interactive as just web, web dev stuff with HTTP and JSON. So what's cool here is gRPC is a, is a community standard. It's something that people are building in the open and they have support for this uh, transcoding thing. And so we're lighting that up in .NET 7. Uh, cool, cool stuff as always with SignalR, including type clients. Uh, MVC, as I mentioned before, some of this new stuff that uh, kind of coming from our fresh look at building applications with uh, minimal APIs, we're also saying like, wow, we'd love to have this in MVC. And we actually did a show kind of recently on uh, ASP.NET Community Standup. I believe it was Bruno that showed this and he showed a bunch of demos there. One other thing I'm not digging into as part of this, but one thing that is being developed is better integration with Orleans. And if you're like me, you've probably seen some cool demos about Orleans. You've seen, wow, they build Halo with it. Um, it's There's these grains and it's stateful actors and it scales well and it's lightweight. And that's about you know all I take away from it. Um, but the, the really cool thing is that uh, it is .NET. It is something that can help scale really well. It's really great for cloud applications. And so this is something where we're working to integrate better with uh, with .NET. So that can include some things like, um, well, for, for instance, uh, Brady Gasser is doing a lot of cool stuff working with this, uh, with the team, Ruben Bonds and others. And um, they're also working on potentially some, some new um, like templates and things to get you started with that. So cool stuff. Uh, there's our, uh, the link to the roadmap there with a the cool AKMS link. All right, so let's talk briefly about the hosting platform improvements, and then we'll start digging in with some server demos. So hosting improvements, as always, performance demos or performance improvements. This slide is already probably completely out of date. This was as of .NET 6 shipping, and there's tons of new stuff. Um, there is including a, um, we did two huge roll-up blog posts. There's one from Stephen Taub on .NET 6 improvements. And then we also did one that inspired by that for ASP.NET also. And it has tons of benchmarks and all kinds of other stuff there. So you can probably Google that up. It's, it's also just on the, um, uh, the ASP.NET blog if you page back a bunch of them. So I'm not going to waste your time with that. But this is devblogs.microsoft.com. .NET, and then um, scrolling back to, I think it was January was when we had that big roll up for ASP.NET. So cool. Um, so as always, I, I, I will, um, I'll be honest, I get a little kind of jaded by this and I just kind of like, yeah, 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 big performance improvements. But there's some huge things in here. For instance, you know, like MVC on Linux, 12% faster, due to logging, um, you know, just all kinds of things where it's like, yeah, 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 40% faster, neat, okay. You know? But it's really cool to see that. And one place um, we're seeing some of these gains is Microsoft is, is uses a ton of .NET internally. And so we're doing these regular blog posts on that where we show our dog fooding um, benefits from this. And for, for instance, like Azure AD uh, serving, you know, billions of requests. And so if they can get you know, 10% improvement, that's huge resource, 
utilization, much better performance, et cetera. So, um, you know, you'll see on the .NET blog, we've got these coming out very regularly where we're, we're talking about what we improve. Uh, thank you, Sean, for, for sharing that. Yeah, that's exactly. It, actually, can you bring that up on the screen? That's the that's link I, if you didn't already, maybe you did. Um, yeah, exactly. That's that's the link there, and that's it's a it's a really cool kind of um, dive into all the different you know things that, that went on there. Actually, I think I can copy this. Ooh, hack. Let's see if I can do this. There it is. Yeah. So, um, and in fact, you know, Brennan said, "Hey, we're we're copying the cool stuff that um, Stephen Tab does." But what's neat with these is it shows all the benchmarking. Uh, you can run these benchmarks yourself. The things that I want to, or the last thing I want to point out performance wise here is that when we fix one of these things in one place, it bubbles all the way up at the stack and affects so many things. So for instance, improvements with span of T continue to be implemented in more places in our stack. And then we find these things as we work with our partners, you know, both outside of Microsoft, but also internal to Microsoft where they'll say, hey, we're, we're running into performance you know, bottleneck somewhere, we'll fix it. And then it just rolls out to everybody. So it's, it's really cool to see those continue to kind of snowball there. All right, so productivity, I talked about hot reload. Um, source generators, people talked about the really cool stuff of source generator that, or being excited about source generators earlier. The idea with source generator is, and source generation is, it is a build time thing and what it does is it builds source based on something. And that can be whatever, like we've got source generators around regular expressions, around JSON files, and in this case, around Razor. And whereas um, previously, there was a decent amount of Razor that was either, you know, like slowly evaluated at runtime, slowly, you know, this is something where we can use a source generator and at build time, we can build a highly optimized version of it. And, and as an example, and this isn't productivity, this goes back to the performance, but things like logging, um, we can also build highly specific loggers. And so using source generation, we can say, okay, we see that you're logging this, we'll actually build a highly performant logger just for that. Um, so pretty cool stuff there. All right, um, more neat stuff. I don't think I talk about it. You know, one other neat thing that just jumps out to me is this strongly type headers API. So this is a thing where just in general, headers are strings, um, but they're also, they're locked in place. They're written, you know, there's, they're not gonna change. And so just having something like a strong, strongly typed header reduces the chance I'm gonna misspell something. So that that's pretty cool there. Um, okay, one other neat thing to watch for. This is not done, this is on the way. And this comes from, you know, this is an example where there's an issue out on GitHub where people said, this is frustrating. Every time I am uh, run, I do .NET new on a Mac, run my application, I get this keychain pop up. What the heck is that? And keychain is saying, do you trust the certificate? And then you trust it. And then you, you create a new .NET app and it asks you again, why is that happening? Well, the reason is because of a few things. One, we use HTTPS by default, or we have, because that's what browsers want. Yep, Neil says that's annoying, and absolutely it is. I do a lot of dev on a Mac, and, and I run into that all the time. So here's why that happens. Uh, HTTPS by default is kind of a best practice. The reasons for that is you want to develop your applications to expect HTTPS. You should only run HTTPS in production and so the, the thinking is that if you develop using HTTPS by default, you're going to test all that stuff out as you develop. Um, uh, another thing going on is that we have this hosting model where every time we develop an application, it actually is creating a new EXE. And the EXE, uh, when, when Mac and Keychain see it, it's, you know, the EXE is completely new. So Keychain, when you say trust this certificate, the thing that's trusting that certificate is some like QR38B.exe. And next .NET app you create is some other, some other EXE. 
And so it's, it's not going to connect it. Long-winded explanation to say, it's all these things working together to make your life hell. What we're doing is uh, we're working on project templates and, um, and defaults and settings so that you can say, I just want, when for local dev, I only want to use HTTP. Um, you can set things using, um, using environment variables. You can, you can set things using your project file and you can set them using your .NET run uh, commands. And so the, the idea with all of this is you're developing on a Mac. You can one time say, I'm doing HTTP local, dude, stop bugging me. And it won't keep bugging you. Um, or you can go and say, I'm, I'm developing and you know, using HTTPS and I want that prompt, or here's how my cert is set up, et cetera. This is work in progress, but I think it's really cool. And the part of the, re I'm explaining this in detail for two reasons. One, anyone that's developed on Mac or Linux has been bitten by this and is frustrated with it. So it's cool to see this changing. But two, and a bigger deal is this is as a result of developers logging issues on the GitHub repo and saying, this is frustrating. Can we fix it? And this has been, this is causing, you know, the team saying, yep, we agree. Let's fix it. And it's a significant effort. You can see here there's change, There's a lot of different um, changes going on to support it, but it's cool to see it happening. So anyways. All right, let's look at a few API and service improvements. Up till this point, I've been talking about all the under the hood stuff that makes things run. Minimal APIs. Uh, one thing I, want, I do want to talk about, I'm talking high level about minimal APIs now, um, but just yesterday I did a two hour event with Safia Abdallah on our team. She is a developer on the, uh, on the team that builds minimal APIs. So she was a, I was able to say like, hey, why does it work this way? And she would explain it to me. So I recommend watching this if you're interested in more uh, minimal API stuff. And I forget, was this my demo? Nope, okay. So, so that is the, if you've got two hours and you wanna go deeper on minimal APIs, that's, that's uh, where you can do it. Um, okay, what are minimal APIs? If you look at file new in like a, you know, a, a .NET 5 solution. You've got a pro program CS that has some boilerplate code that in most cases you don't change. And then that boilerplate code in program CS calls your startup CS. And your startup CS starts with a bunch of using statements and then a namespace and then a bunch of kind of code that we know is important because we've like bothered to learn it. But if you're new to .NET, it's kind of a lot of code. It's not code that you would write by hand because if you mess it up, none, nothing works and you get weird cryptic errors because dependency injection wasn't configured correctly or something. Meanwhile, in the rest of the web dev world, you've got, you know, like Python and, and Node, et cetera. You can create an application in a few lines of code. So the team looked at this and they said, can we create a better experience for some specific cases? So as somebody said earlier, uh, looking in the poll about minimal APIs, they said, interested in minimal APIs and also why would you use it except for really simple apps? Well, there are some very specific cases where you'd use it. And then there are cases where you wouldn't use it. Um, it is great for that beginner getting started experience, which is a, a real, um, it, it's an important use case. We want to keep seeing more .NET developers. We want, we, um, you know, want to be a, a platform that's interesting and compelling compared to other platforms. We also want, you know, professors to like it and students to like it. Um, so it, it is important. You want to have junior devs working for you that, that know .NET, and this is a part of that. Another um, case for, for minimal APIs is that it's also good for microservices. And um, because if you think about the long history about where we got to APIs, uh, web APIs with .NET, first of all, going way, way back, we had, I mean, going way, way back, we had classic ASP. And then we built ASP.NET in .NET framework. And that actually had some things in it that still handled some AS, classic ASP things. Um, some of the response and requests and stuff objects. Then we got ASP.NET MVC. And ASP.NET MVC was actually built on top of ASP.NET with, um, with web forms. 
And then, um, then we got ASP.NET Core, which is cool and rethinks a lot of stuff, but it also still brings over some stuff for, from ASP.NET and .NET Framework because we, we didn't want to, we, we had to make this balance of not throwing everything out. We want to be able to let you migrate your stuff from ASP.NET in .NET Framework to ASP.NET Core. Then on top of MVC, we saw a bunch of people were using our controllers, which were really designed for building web apps. They were using them also to serve uh, REST endpoints. And so there were all these abstractions on them, things like uh, filters and um, you know different binders you can put on and different, uh, you could override a lot of different things. Okay, long story, going back 20 years, right? The the end result is there are some design decisions and some ways that web web APIs work that date back a long time and are not really super necessary now and are not widely used in your apps. However, there's overhead to them. We still are doing some things where we're you know scanning for things and we're we're figuring out how to route something based on the name of a controller and things like that. Um, and so you can actually, if you're building a lightweight modern API, there's less code that has to run in a minimal API. So those are the main cases that I would say is one, if you're building microservices, you want something small, fast startup, um, you know, that is a, a great case. And then the other is just kind of learning. Uh, I guess a third is if you're just building a quick application and you just want to get in and write some code. So, um, so let's take a quick look. Enough talking, let's go in. Um, let me see, actually I started up code, but I wanted to, wanted to actually start from the console. So we'll go here and we'll say, um, let's start with .NET new web um, minimal API. Okay. So, there's actually two different templates you could use to create a minimal API. There's .NET New Web and there's .NET New Minimal API. And you would think minimal API. Actually, let's let's do .NET New Minimal API. Minimal API template thingy. Okay. So first up. Uh, uh, minimal, uh, maybe I just minimal. That's what I get for winging things. Uh, dot net new, new list. Okay, and then it is. The point is <laughs> that I should have stuck with the minimal API. Oh, that's it, because I need to do dash minimal. Um, I'm not going to go into that, but the, the point is there are actually two different ones. And the other one that I um, could have done creates an application with a weather forecast controller, et cetera. And that's actually more lines of code than the one that was just the um, web, .NET new web. So let's uh, see where we're at, CD minimal, okay, code dot. All right. So we've got our minimal app. Let's just take a look at what's in here. First of all, we've got our, our CS proj. One thing to notice, and this is in all the new templates, is we've got nullable enabled by default and implicit usings enabled by default. You can turn these off if you want, um, but they're they're part of all the templates and they're pretty useful. I will say this actually caused me to start caring about nullable warnings a lot more, and it's good. Um, and it's better to care about them early on in your applications. Um, so you get a lot of warnings if you if you um, are not paying attention. Here I actually have .NET 7, but oh well. Um, we could change that if I change this to 6, or we could, um, et cetera. One thing that I actually do, if I do .NET new with a .NET 5, sometimes I'll show people upgrading to .NET 6 is, in a lot of cases, as simple as changing that. So. Um, let's, just so I don't break things, I'm, I'm on .NET 7. Um, if we go into our program CS, you'll see this is a new minimal API. There's no startup, so this does everything as far as getting my application bootstrapped and running. 
if, by the way, you're curious, why does it pop up with this? Watch in the upper left, the upper left, where's my, I don't know. Watch in the upper left and you'll see a .vs code folder. And that's all that prompt is doing is it's setting up your launch tasks so that VS Code knows how if you hit the debug um, or run keys F5 or whatever, it knows how to start the app. Okay. So we've got our program CS, and this is literally what four lines of code. So we create a builder, the builder creates an app, and then we say um, map get, and we're able to use this to map a route to some code. And that's really it. Um, I want to go to one that's slightly, not much, but a little bit more advanced than that. And this is one that I actually did for that Learn Live yesterday. So if you want to see this in more action, this is one where we build out an API that manages a list of pizzas. And let's see how that kind of builds over time. So here we've got things like map git. We've also got here a map kit that is now integrating with any framework. And you would normally use like a service class here. You wouldn't talk directly to any framework necessarily. But the idea here is we're able to, in one line of code, say when I say request pizzas, it's going to get a list of pizzas. Um, another neat thing here is that it's really smart about mapping the inputs. So for instance, if I say map post to this pizza endpoint, I'm passing it a few parameters here. One is this is actually a service mapping to an ED framework, and this is mapping to the posted object, which is JSON. And so it actually is able to see, OK, this one's a service. This one is a posted body, and it's able to map all that. So you end up with just a few lines of code here in order to do that. Um, you do, at a certain point, run into um, a, a place where you've got more lines of code than you want in one file. And if that's the case, there's no problem. You can put this in another class. And um, there's actually um, support for doing that using, I can, I can actually show that, I think. If I do, let's do a new project. You can use scaffolding, which is a new feature. It's available both in, um, and now I'm going off script. Things are going to go crazy. Um, scaffolding is available both in Visual Studio, and it's also available from command line. Um, let's build a new app. So let's build a Windows Forms. What on earth? Uh, API. Here I'm going to say, OK, that looks good. Now I'm going to say I want to not use controllers. So this is this allows me to use minimal APIs if I uncheck this. Now, this is an important point. You'll see over and over people say, like, hey, .NET 6 is out with minimal APIs. It's also out with API controllers. So if you like API controllers, keep using them. And you'll notice that's even the default there. Okay. So I'm just going to say uncheck that. I do want to use API support. Go create. Oh, I did. I did something wrong. I'm gonna actually. It's too late. I will. This is gonna be a little slower here. I'm actually gonna do that again. The reason is I wanted to create this using authentication, and I'll tell you why. I want to have a database because I want to scaffold using Entity Framework, and. I want to have a database in order to do that. And one short, easy little hack is to create it using authentication, because then it has to create a database for me. So I don't have to do that, but that is an easy way to do that. So I'll say, um, actually, no, I don't want this. Now I'm a little confused here. Oh, let's see what happens. All right. Dun, dun, dun. OK, what I'm going to show here is using scaffolding to create an, a static API endpoints class. So now it's going through. It is going through now. See, now I've done a, I've created this connected services item. I didn't actually want to do that. This is, by the way, this is a neat new thing. This is this uh, 
MS Identity Tool, and this actually can be used with the Microsoft Identity Platform. All right, I'm going to go back to the previous one. So recent solutions, 21. 21 was actually my lucky one. Okay, so here we've got my program. It's exact. Uh, this is one. Remember when I said that you can also create using this weather controller? So this is your weather forecast, and you can see here this is one where um, it shows an example mapping to a get and getting a list of um, weather forecasts. All right. So I will add on a class. We're going to make a person class. We're going to give them an ID and a name. Okay. Uh, nope. ID, uh, name. Okay. And notice there, this is saying, wait a minute, is that nullable? Did you want it to be notable? Nullable? I could do that. I could do, a, I could set it to default, etc. I'll just go ahead and make it nullable. Okay. So now, what I want to show here, this is something you may not have seen. If I say add new scaffolded item, I know this is small on the screen here, but I'm just saying add new scaffolded item. And then there's some new things on the list here. And I can say API controller using Entity Framework. But I can also say API with read write endpoints using Entity Framework. So this one is if I want a controller. This is if I want a minimal API. So this is the same sort of scaffolding that we've had before with controllers. This gives you that same sort of experience using minimal APIs. So let's see, it may or may not work because I don't have a database, but we'll, we'll just go for it, okay? Call it person endpoint. We will say, yeah, we don't have data contacts. Let's create one and we'll say add. Last time I did this on a um, presentation, it took a while because it's actually pulling in some NuGet packages that are used to scaffold, et cetera. So the, the um, idea is that it creates an endpoints class and the endpoints class has a bunch of static things. And, and what's important there is that we're able to group them. So going back a little bit to this, here I've got a pizza and I've got a pizza DB. And then let's say my application had multiple things. Maybe I sell pizzas and I've also got a customer table and I've got uh, you know an orders table, et cetera. And so I don't want to just keep throwing all of those into one big long file. And so the idea is if I use scaffolding, um, I can group them. Or I could just manually put these all in a file. Um, so so uh, I'll show one other thing here. as Because I think this scaffolding thing is actually going to take a little bit of time. Did it complete? It's still going. That's why I'm hopping over to this one. So here's an example where we've got uh, the output of that scaffolding. So here it goes through, it creates a, um, a static class, and then there's a method. There's a single method in here, um, and the method just has all these map get, map post, et cetera. So this one I've actually deleted the ones because we don't allow updating the speakers via post or put. Um, but if I go into here, this session, this was, again, this is just that right-click scaffold. And this is all available via command line, too. So um, the same ASP.NET Core scaffold, scaffolders. Well, John, quick, quick question for you we've got uh, around in terms of the bootstrapping. The question around, are there any changes in bootstrapping in terms of CSS, in terms of like migrating from .NET 5 to 6, is similar to what happened with going from 3 to 5? I remember there's some large changes at that point, too. So and any comments on, on that from the, from the front end of things? Yeah, great question. I will be showing that in just a bit. So I'm, I'm showing the well, services stuff. Yep, uh, I'm showing services, and then next I'll be going to Razor Pages and MVC, and I, I'm, that is one of the things I'm showing. So you're one step ahead of me, Governor Silver. Okay, so um, so I think this is still running, and I'm just going to let it. Um, I'm going to um, cancel out. But normally, actually, that actually usually runs fast if you've already got a database to scaffold into. The deal there is it's like I've got to do this. I've got to create a database. I've got to do all this stuff. The, the main point I want to show you is that um, we have heard, 
and this is feedback I gave the team too, that I don't want to program CS as 400 lines of code long. I want to be able to have some same grouping. The team says, hey, you can group your code however you want. It's C-sharp code, and that is true. But it's nice to have this pattern here where I can scaffold, and it will you know, put that grouping logically based on my model objects. So, so that's that. The one other thing I want to show about services before I move to, um, to the web, uh, building websites and web apps. Uh, this is transcoding. This is just really a, a nice, simple demo. This is something James Newton King uh, built, and he actually showed on the ASP.NET standup. The idea here is um, this is a proto file for a gRPC endpoint. And you'll see here, this is what was required in order to put gRPC, uh, to put that HTTP transcoding, transcoding on here. So this allows you to, to browse to slash uh, v1 greeter or greeter by name, and, um, and, and that includes that. So other than that, it's standard gRPC. There's like one other line of code in the startup uh, where we say uh, use transcoding. There it is, adjacent transcoding. And there's, I believe, a, a NuGet package pulled in. And so just you know, super quick demo of this. And then we'll move on to the uh, web apps and websites. So, uh, and this is uh, pretty sure this one, this is in the gRPC repo. Um, so let's see if this pops up. Spinning up, spinning up. Okay, so this is that gRPC endpoint, and then I'm able to say, um, you know, get John, and uh, and then I could also post to it. Um, so, anyways, there's that's just standard kind of. This is honestly one of the cases I would want to use it as a developer um, to be able to work with it. All right, so that is the stuff around services. Let me hop over into um, web app stuff. Um, so yeah, gRPC, this is the main thing I showed there. Um, a question about Swagger for gRPC transcoding. I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that. Um, this is another neat thing that was added there was that client side load balancing. So the client is just doing round robin um, requests and then if one fails it falls over or it retries and this is just built in so, all right one last thing i do want to show with minimal apis is this support for route groups so as i mentioned before this is something where you know being able to control or manage a bunch of different endpoints um, is is something where it was easy to do with api controllers you could put an attribute or something in the constructor for the entire API controller. And you just don't have that with minimal APIs because they're just a bunch of individual functions. And so with this, this allows you to create groups and the groups can actually be nested. So you can have a group route builder that adds more group routes, that adds more group routes. Um, and then you can set specific things on, on that group, which is pretty nice. All right, so moving on to web sites. Um, uh, CSS isolation, really nice feature. This is something actually I'm excited about. I help write some of the code for the .NET website. And um, this is something where we use SCSS and a build process that builds out different, uh, but you end up with this big CSS file. Um, even though it's you know compiled down every page is parsing all the CSS. And then you have body class and your body class is the selector and it's kind of a lot. What's neat with CSS isolation, it's just built in. Uh, it's actually something that came from Blazor first. We added it for Blazor components. And then uh, we said, why don't we add this also for Razor pages and MVC? So I'll show you that. Uh, Bootstrap 5.1, just included in the templates by default. Um, so those are the main things I'll show there. So, and then hopefully, um, hopefully I show what you were interested in with that. If not, um, I don't know what to say. Okay, .NET. So first of all, I can say .NET new. 
I'll be honest, you saw me earlier, I forgot what one of them was. Um, you can get a list of them here. So for instance, .NET New Web App or Razor is how I'd create a Razor Pages app. That is the short list. If I say also .NET New List, because I have Maui installed and all the things, there's, there's a ton more of them. Um, so th these are all the other sorts of things that I could create. So, um, so if I say .NET Razor, um, and we'll call this. Right. Bam, cool. Here we go. Cool. The first thing I want to show you here is that this template is also pretty minimal. So all the demos that you see about minimal APIs will focus on minimal APIs. Um, or Minimal templates, they always focus on minimal APIs. But this is also just across the board. And you know, if you're developing ASP.NET apps, you've probably seen all this, but this is, I think, worth calling out. There's no program and or there's no startup class. Program here also is pretty lightweight. This is all that's kind of required. Um, if you do want to create a namespace, you can. If you, you know, um, there's a default one that's kind of a, a shadow namespace that's created for it. Uh, but this is this is that application. A uh, question on, before on what's in the you know what Bootstrap or whatever. So this is uh, Bootstrap five Oops, by default here. So a lot of digging for not that much excitement. But this is Bootstrap five by default. Um, so this has all the fancy Bootstrap stuff. Um, so that's nice, Bootstrap five and Bootstrap five has a lot of nice things in there, including um, you know, more support for, for uh, variables. There's not a dependency on job or on uh, jQuery, although we do include jQuery in here um, for, for validation. Um, but so, so that's just kind of included by default, which is neat. Um, let's go in and look at hot reload and um, CSS isolation. So I'm going to pop up on my terminal. We'll say uh, .NET, instead of .NET build, .NET run, et cetera, I'll type .NET watch. This does a few things. It builds the application, it restores, it builds the application, it starts it in, um, in hot reload, in, you know, with hot reload enabled, and it also pops open a browser window. Hopefully it's gonna pick the right browser window. Yeah, Neil's good question about de not depending on jQuery for validation. This is actually a um, discussion I had recently with Rob Connery. And it's it's something where it doesn't seem like it's necessary anymore because with the form fields, HTML5 form fields that are widely supported now, you can have patterns that enforce all that kind of front end stuff. So it does seem like something that would be nice to change. Um, there are you know, things that are being worked on for authentication. Honestly, I think it's, um, I don't know when it would land, but I, I would like to see that updated. That would be nice. Um, okay, so here's my application. It's running. Let's change this welcome to a different color. Okay, so we will, um, I will pop this up. We'll actually shrink it down. I'll see if I can get some sort of, Side by side thing happening. So let's put that kind of there. Ah. Okay. okay, so now I'm going to go into my page. I'm going to go to, I'm going to, now I need to create it using the right name. So I'm going to go, I'm going to select my pages folder. I'm going to say add new index.cshtml. CSS. So it is grouped. It is. It, it works by convention. If I did this in Visual Studio, full Visual Studio, it actually nests these nicely. Um, you'll notice that down at the bottom, some things happened in the terminal because it's like, oh, the file's been added. Okay, stuff's happening there. Now I'll create an H1, and we'll go, and we'll say, there we go. Why not? 
GitHub Copilot doing some things for me. It's um, doing hot reload, and it says it succeeded. Now I need to actually refresh it, I guess. This is one of those things where hot reload will kind of sometimes work, and sometimes it depends. Maybe I did something wrong. What is happening? Did I save it? Index.cshtml.css, h1, red, green, blue. That should totally work. All right. That's so funny because last time I did this, I'm pretty sure it did work. So now let's do about that run again. Don't watch. That's going to pop it open. Hopefully I did this right. There it is. OK. So, um, so now digging into how this actually works, this is kind of interesting. It creates a an attribute, um, it creates this strangely named attribute and sets the color for it. And if I actually click on here, you'll see um, there are some other um, scoped CSS things, but here is one specifically there. Um, and there's, there's other information about configuring that, et cetera. So what's neat with this is this attribute is unique for that for that element on that page. And so it's only going to apply there. So if I go to any other page on the site and I look at my other, you know, it's not going to apply on my privacy page, for instance. So that is pretty handy. Um, I think those are the main things I had to show there. Um, that. CSS isolation, hot reload, bootstrap 5.1. The thing I will say about hot reload is it is something where they're continue. It's first of all, it's completely magical that it works at all. The idea that you're changing code and it's injecting it into a running application and it kind of works some of the time is awesome. They are continuing to work to build things out. For instance, like in an application with Swagger, um, it's not going to rebuild the Swagger and the Swagger UI and all that stuff until you stop and restart. Um, if you're adding uh, you know, classes that are complex or whatever, it's a lot of the time it's not going to work. I still tend to always do .NET watch, uh, and I try and just make that my standard thing instead of typing .NET run. I just kind of always do um, .NET watch. So, All right. One other cool thing I do want to show um, is uh, incremental migration to ASP.NET Core. This is, you know, we're always talking about, here's the super fancy new stuff. I do know that there are real world, there are developers that are updating existing ASP.NET apps on .NET Framework, um, and that's a pain point. And this is something where members of our team are working with, you know, large companies. And, um, and so uh, Taylor Southwick, Mike Russos, and others are, uh, have built this really cool stuff with um, system web adapters and YARP. YARP is yet another reverse proxy. So the idea here is this allows you to incrementally migrate your application to ASP.NET Core. So let's say you've got an existing ASP.NET app. You add a new ASP.NET Core application on top of it. It will proxy. It will. Um, you can implement the new code in ASP.NET Core. For cases where it's not implemented, it'll proxy back to the ASP.NET application. And uh, thanks, Sean, for, for sharing that link there. Um, and so it'll proxy back, and it uses these system web adapters. And those system web adapters can do some really amazing things, including support for system.web things, and also things like sharing authentication between the two running applications. So uh, there's a full blog post on this. Uh, we're actually um, on the um, 20, so this is incremental. Migration. We there was a, um, a build session on this, and we've got on the 28th we've got Taylor coming on the ASP.NET Community Standup, and he's going to be teaching me a lot more about it. One other thing I do want to show with this is I'm going to bring up. I've got an MVC application, and there's actually a preview uh, extension, and so I've created a new uh, ASP.NET MVC app using ASP.NET MVC 5, good old fashioned, you know, here's my web config, bringing back some fond memories, 
.NET Framework, et cetera. So now I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to say migrate project. So it brings up this thing and it's actually going to say start a migration. Now, um, this is all stuff that I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not an expert after this part of it. So it's a, it's a little exciting, but select the migration project. I'm going to say a new project. We'll say, great, this is a test course, sure, why not? And so, so now it's going through and it's start, It's building a new front end, this ASP.NET Core front end, and it's setting up YARP to proxy back to the old one and then um, doing some other, you know, like smart stuff in, in terms of um, setting it up so that I can then start my incremental migration over. So if I look, here's my new project. My new project includes this um, map reverse proxy, and then it's able to proxy back to this old running project. And then I can continue to dev on both of them together. So the problem this solves is, you know, we we um, keep saying, we tell people like, hey, you're on .NET Framework, you should get on .NET Core, and they say, or, you know, .NET 6, and people say, that's great, I have an existing business to run, and I can't just drop everything, I got to keep my app running. And so this allows you to do an incremental migration. So if you're watching this, and you're saying like, wow, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of stuff that you're showing is not super useful. Um, this is something that you know applies to those developing legacy applications. Can Yarp work with web forms? I well, so kind of technically yes, although I'm not sure as far as the migration experience. And the reason I'm saying technically yes is Yarp can proxy to anything. So it can proxy to PHP. It really doesn't matter. It's just a proxy. Um, and then the system web adapters has a lot of stuff for supporting um, supporting other things. I think MVC is, you know, by far the main. Uh, let's see if web forms. What? Yeah, so there's your answer. That's pretty cool, right? So it actually is a supported case. I was thinking you might be able to maybe get it to work, but um, yeah. So there you go. Great yeah, that that's amazing. That's downright amazing. It's super cool. This is an example of one of those things where real world, we've got dev teams at Microsoft that are working with large companies that have existing legacy apps. And they've been doing th the upgrade assistant is another really cool thing. Um, so if we go to dot, .net, I'm going to go to, no, that's that. By the way, this is super silly, but this is a, a glitch app I built. This is how we build our community standup on things. So when we've got, here's my speaker, who says, and then I create, click generate, and it actually copies from an SVG file um, using a canvas, copies it to a PNG. So this is just really ridiculously silly. Okay, dot net. Okay, so I'm just showing quickly the upgrade assistant. Upgrade assistant does more than just um, web apps. It also helps with like a, a WPF, WinForms. Um, so this is also an example of stuff that the um, the team is, as they work with these large clients, um, corporate clients, and then they say like, hey, can we build this in a way that um, can be abstracted? So this is actually pretty, pretty like crazy to see it actually work. And I've gone through and done these labs where you actually take a an existing um, application and update it. And it's like, it's pretty wild to see it work. So. It's not perfect, but it'll definitely save you a lot of time. And it's built using these best practices that we run into regularly. So, all right. I'm going to move on. We've talked about web sites. Let's talk briefly about web apps. And then I'm probably going to be short on time. OK, so the stuff I want to show with web sites, let me, I guess, go back to the slides here. OK, there's that. With single page apps, uh, in the past, the way that it worked was file new project was the template. And the template knew everything about ASP.NET Core. And then it used JavaScript services. And it included all the React and Angular stuff. And it proxied back to React and Angular. There's a few problems with that. One is you're waiting for us to update our templates for you to get built-in support for Angular and React. 
Two is all the tutorials, docs, and everything in the world don't do that. <laughs> they tell you to go go to NPM, get create React app, get, get the NG tools, et cetera, and use the NPM-based ecosystem tools in order to build your client app. And then they have their own like Webpack support. And um, so we were kind of going ag against it in a way that you could make it work, but it wasn't super clean. And so the new system actually proxies back the other way. So I'm going to show, um, I'll show that real quick. So, okay, .NET, uh, .NET, dot .new, I think that should work. New, um, let's say React, and we call out. And I also have one now. As part of the fun of any React or Angular app, there's NPM Restore, which will take about 30 years. So I actually have one where I've actually I've got all that restored, but we'll see. Um, so we'll go um, uh, sample React. Cool. So here's my app. Um, you'll see a few things about this. First of all, if we look in my program CS, it only has really one line that's going to make it obvious that there's a, Re a React thing happening. Um, and this is just mapping. So any request to index.html, that's the fallback. So if there's a missing thing happening, it's going to fall back to index.html. And all of the React stuff is in here. Um, so this is my entire React application. If you look at your React application, this is the way a React developer would actually build things. You've got stuff like package JSON. Um, you've got, you know, like your standard even README, and it says this was built using Create React App. So this is if you, let's say you're on a team and you're the ASP.NET dev and you're building the API backend, and then you've got your React developer, you could basically say, this is your folder. Go to town, friend, and they own this folder. Now you may say, wait a minute, what's going on here? Why is there this, uh, why are these, these ASP.NET Core? And so there's some very small things for integration, mostly in terms of, um, so this one has, uh, there's mostly things in terms of integrating with the ASP.NET created certificate. So you'll see a few things there, but for the most part, this is just your standard React stuff. Um, so I'm actually going to switch over to my Angular one, which is done the same sort of way, but I've just done NPM Restore on it. Um, when I With either of these applications, if we look at my CS proj, you'll see in the CS proj, there's stuff like NPM Start. There's the NPM Restore, NPM Install. So what we've done is we've updated our CS proj file to just tell it about npm install, npm build, et cetera. And so if you want to go and change, configure how, how you're interacting with npm, this is where that happens. But the nice thing is I can just say like .NET run. It's going to spin up two things. It's going to spin up the front end. Um, it's going to spin up two console apps, basically. So one is the, uh, the spa development server. And one is my application. Um, so here, what? There's NPM, right? So this is what the Angular developer would expect to see normally, right? This is just your, uh, your Angular integration running. So I've got two things going on here. If you look what's in my terminal window down below, this is my .NET app spinning up. And if we look at this terminal up above, this is the Angular app spinning up. So this is actually kind of working the way that you would build this you know, normally. This is kind of a much more sane way of working. So now I can go in. I can uh, develop against this. I can browse to that. Let's see if maybe it works. Uh, oh, so that's because I'm browsing to log one. And it's actually kind of boring when I do browse to it because all it is is I get to see the running application. There it is. Percent spot development server. 
And so I actually get this dev server view. Um, so the idea here is it's kind of a much smoother integration. A few things this benefits me. One is I can go and actually look at the docs for Reactor Angular, and it actually makes sense. I can work with a developer um, that knows Reactor Angular, or if you're a developer that really knows Reactor Angular, it's all like built in a way that makes sense. Um, the two kind of are kept in a nice separate um, separate way of working. Um, another thing that's great about that is if I want to go in and update stuff, I can do that. So I can go uh, in my application. Uh, all things. Okay, great. So if I wanted to go through and use any of the scaffolding commands, I could just do that. I could go in here, or if I want to write, um, you know, if I want to integrate in here, I can just go and do that. So that's that's my quick spiel on npm React. Also, because of the way this is set up, we just have templates for uh, for React and Angular, but you basically could go in, put whatever you want in this client app, and then update your CS proj right here if you have any other custom commands that you need to run. Um, most of the time, you're going to do npm, npm install, um, you know, npm run build, et cetera. So this stuff doesn't necessarily need to change too much, but that's the general idea. And then as Niels points out too, yeah, the integration now with Webpack is just the standard uh, Webpack stuff. So you're going to have your Webpack config stuff just directly in here. Uh, and including all your testing, like your EDE testing and all that stuff. That's just, it's your standard, it's a standard Angular app at this point. So, all right, cool. Let's talk one more thing here, um, looking at Blazor. So, Ton of stuff going on with Blazor. Um, there is, uh, I'll, you know, mention a few high things in here. There's, there's hot reload. There's um, error boundaries is really cool. If you've developed using uh, using Blazor, you'll run into cases where something fails to load. There's some sort of timeout, etc., and the entire thing looks bad. So what this allows you to do is put a boundary around just a specific component. And, um, and you'll see an error boundary there. We actually, I was happy to implement this um, on the um, live.net. So the .NET Live TV, where we host all our community standups, this is a Blazor component. This whole page is Blazor. And actually, this uses a Blazor um, error boundary around it now. So. This was one of those dog fooding cases where I was like developing on here. I'm like, hold on, we don't have an error boundary there. And so we actually just popped one in. It was like two lines of code. And now if anything fails to load, it's a much more cleaner experience. It's able to show an error message on um, around the thing that failed to load instead of the entire page um, looks bad. So, um, so there's that. Um, cool. I want to just very quickly show the... Um, .NET Podcast app, and then move towards wrapping up. Um, and I, I think um, I think you were saying, Sean, it's okay to run like slightly long. It's it's um, not a, a huge deal. For, for you, John, we've got all the time in the world. Oh, no, but, man. But, but seriously, we, we typically wrap up around 8, but if folks are still here and, and you've got the time, the, feel free to take it for as long as makes sense for you. Okay, actually, that's probably I'll, I'll be done, including um, questions. I'll I'll be done by then. So. Well, we're not going to bring out the big cane and Yankee off stage or anything like that. Okay, cool. Um, uh, let me see. Let's Google it up. So I'm in, and I've learned this question the hard way. I'm in a private browser instance. Um, so I I always do that. I always share from a private browser instance. Um, so uh, .NET uh, podcasts GitHub is a quick way to find this. This is our kind of reference application. And this is actually built using a bunch of things, including Maui, but it also, the web client is built using Blazor. One thing that I like about this is that, Google Bing it, exactly. One um, thing that I like about this is this is an actual application. This is a web app that I would build using Blazor. Um, this is a website that I would mostly build using Razor Pages. And that's what we do. This is generally pretty static. There are cases like, for instance, this page. This is dynamic, but it's not something that's interactive. 
It's not super interactive. This is something where we pull a service, uh, we cache it for an hour. Um, it's something where it it is a dynamic site, things like the um, downloads page. This is updated from service. Um, if you look at you know these different areas where you can learn uh, interactive coding, this there's interactive stuff on here. But for the most part, it's a site, um, including even if it's something where I'm like shopping online at a store. That's generally pretty interactive, or it's generally pretty server side friendly, right? Um, but something like this, a podcast application, this is something where it's an app. And so this is an example where I kind of mentally make that that shift over to. Um, and if we look, I just uh, all the code is there. Um, the the Blazor portion of it, um, you know, pretty, uh, it's a reference application. So this is something where we work with the team, people review it, they argue and fight over the code. And so by the time it ships, this is something where we actually recommend, you know, this is a way to, um, if you're building a Blazor application, this is how to do it. So you look at something like, here's this floating player. Um, here's, you know, here's that component. Um, and then we've got the code below. Um, and so this is, you know, if you want to look into that, we also have a full uh, workshop where, um, where we go into more depth on it. What I actually want to do, though, is talk more about how I think about Blazor and WebAssembly in general now. Um, okay, one other thing that I'd forgotten is Blazor Hybrid. This is super cool. If you are a web developer who thinks Maui is neat, you want to build applications that can run on Mac and Windows and Android and iOS and Tizen, et cetera. That's pretty neat, but I'm not super comfortable with XAML. Like I can kind of get there, but I'm not going to be happy about it. I love HTML, CSS, a little JavaScript, definitely some C sharp, but you know, that HTML, HTML, CSS, man, I can write that all day. So what's cool is I can write Blazor application and I can, integrate it with a Maui app. So the way that actually is working is Maui is hosting my Blazor app. I can use any native components or native services that I want to. So I want to use the camera or native location, or I want to integrate with a, a flyout, or um, we show an example in the um, podcast application where we actually, um, where we use like the, the player the actual, um, you know, native like Android or iOS player in your in your phone. Um, so so that is it's it's kind of for me sort of the best case because I can be really productive. I can share code that I've written in Blazor um, for a web application, and I can use it in a in a um, native app. So this is this is something that I'm I'm pretty happy about. Um, it is one of the ways you can build Maui applications. Um, and there are occasionally, you know, like if you want fully everything super native, of course, you're going to probably write it using XAML. But in a huge amount of cases, you know, I, I talked to David Ort now about this. I'm like, where, you know, what are, what are some places where you're just, it's not going to work? And he's like, well, maybe in a game, but even then you can write some pretty intense, you know, games and stuff on, using Blazor now. So anyways, that's that. Okay, I want to actually talk about how I think about Blazor. And, um, you know, for, first, um, there's a question a little bit ago about, like, um, from Gray Noble about, you know, loving Blazor, but is it growing? Is it stagnating, et cetera? And I think that's a good question. However, I've, um, so going way back, um, when Blazor was first announced, the way it was shown off was, we're using WebAssembly in the browser with C Sharp. And so a lot of people saw that and interpreted it in different ways. Some people said, awesome, I hate JavaScript. I'm a C Sharp .NET dev. I hate JavaScript, never want to write a line of code again. And what's more, Blazor is going to take over the world. JavaScript's going to die a horrible death it deserved. And everything's going to be Blazor. That was never going to be the case, right? Because there are a lot of people that love writing JavaScript, Node and NPM, big ecosystem, um, you know, all of other front end frameworks, big, useful ecosystem. 
Um, and there's a ton of great JavaScript libraries out there. So I don't really think that, you know, like, do I want to make sure that Blazor stays around? Absolutely. I like it. And, you know, really, like, I think you can say, like, hey, the team is, is managing what they're building in .NET 7 up through .NET 9 using, you know, using Blazor. So, yeah, we're using Blazor quite a bit. Um, so, but as long as it stays around, I don't need it to take over the world. Um, so anyways, I think that that was sort of the first thing was I love jobs or I love C sharp. I want, I want Blazor to win. I, I want it to take over the web. It's not going to do that, but it, it's, it doesn't need to really. Right. Um, over time, however, though, remember the team and especially the, you know, the main inventor of Blazor, Steve Sanderson, you know, previous to that, he built, um, now my brain's going to stop working. He built a whole front end, um, somebody will answer in the chat, he built a whole front end web system, Knockout, right? <laughs> Knockout, which is a whole component system built in JavaScript. Um, and, you know, that was actually used for like the, the Azure portal and all this other stuff. So when you start building front end heavy applications, you need, you have different needs than server side applications. You want to build using components. You need to manage state. You need to, you know, whereas like a server side, we're a little bit spoiled. We, we you, you ping a, a server. The server gives you a bunch of HTML, JavaScript, sends you some cookies and forgets about you basically, right? And so there's different challenges. And so over time, we actually, um, the team has been continuing to build this component-based web development system that uses .NET. And if you think about where else components are big in .NET, well, it's in desktop applications, and it's also going way back, even things like web forms. So we actually have an entire book um, for uh, Blazor for web forms developers. And you know, it's actually a really nice migration path. If you are a, uh, a web forms developer, you're used to components and the whole like MVC and even Razor pages with the page model is confusing. Gosh, you know, component-based development is, is kind of nice. Um, and even bigger picture, you think about uh, like React and Angular, part of what's made them successful is this whole componentization of the web, right? So it's made it easier for teams to um, focus on building one component to, um, to really kind of, you know, build with this component-based mindset. And so that's sort of what I saw as kind of, the second sort of version of um, of Blazor. But now I'm seeing some just crazy stuff. Um, and really what I think about it is the web world is just moving at lightning speed and modern C Sharp and .NET are moving pretty darn fast. And so now we're seeing some amazing things with WASI. And this is just an, an area where I'm just going to, you know, like as I'm wrapping up, this is just a crazy thing that that we're looking at. So. And when I say we're, I'm saying like Steve and smart people like him. Um, this was a session at Build. I'm curious if you know if people saw this. Um, I this was one that just kind of blew my mind. Um, the idea here it, it blew my mind too. It was right? <laughs> I, it was one of the few that I was I caught in full, and I, I couldn't believe what was what was happening there. So like it, it it felt like the future. It was one of those sessions that really felt like the future. Steve is amazing. He just never disappoints. Every time it's like, okay, what's he got for us today? Um, so the idea here is big picture. Um, web assembly. So we had browsers that were doing a bunch of stuff with JavaScript. IE was slow. Chrome wanted to be faster. They built this really cool virtual machine that um, compiles as much as is possible your JavaScript. And so then it's not interpreting big strings. It's actually like running compiled, jitted, whatever JavaScript. I don't know how they do it. They do magic things. So then over time, all the browsers started doing this. And they have these this sandbox um, that did a few things. One, it isolated code. But two is it, it executed this like pre-compiled um, binary representation of the JavaScript. And then over time, they said, um, well, could, since we're already managing this, this pre-compiled stuff, could we make it so that you can actually compile it as part of your build process? Or could we write code in another language that'll compile to this binary representation thing? I'm doing a lot of jazz hands here. Um, so 
So eventually what we ended up with was this thing called WASM, WebAssembly. And WebAssembly does a few things. One is it is pre-compiled code. It is, uh, it's binary, it's small, it's tight. It's also um, does, it's, um, it's sandbox. It's built to run in a sandbox. It doesn't do all kinds of things. It's, it's a stack-based system for executing mostly web applications. And that's what it does. Um, so that's cool. Then, then people started saying, well, could we actually, like, we've got containers with Docker. Docker is abstracting an entire operating system that has multi-user login that could potentially have windowing systems and printers and USB support and blah, 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 all this other stuff. What if instead of abstracting away a server, even at a container level, what if we build an abstract application platform? And so, so that's kind of where this is going then, is that they said, well, OK, in order to do that, we need this system interface. Um, so WebAssembly system interface, it's, it's either system interface or server interface. Um, so I, I just say WASI, and it's right. Um, but the, those interfaces allow for other things that say, for instance, I want to run an application and it needs to um, needs additional um, services. So that's what WASI extends WASM to do. So at the end of the day, you are the, the idea is a very kind of lighter weight um, container sort of thing. It's actually much smaller. And there's some really cool comparisons where even you know a Docker container can be 100 megabytes or whatever, right? Whereas a WASI um, container can can bring things down to like small kilobytes like or you know a few megabytes and so this is just an experiment this is something where um i've played around looking at this um this uh this repo and it's really neat this is something where eventually the team is looking like hey we can compile dotnet code to web assembly we're doing that already for Blazor, and could we actually host applications using that? So actually, let's go out and check out a very simple um, example of that. And that is here. This is Steve Sanderson MS. So let me, I will, first of all, I'll pop this into one browser, and then I'll bring it over to this one. First of all, what on earth is happening there? OK, what's going on is it actually start. it's hosting ASP.NET in my browser. And this is actually running on github.io, um, which github.io, as, as you'll know, does not host ASP.NET. So this is GitHub pages. I'll say uh, Got to put in some emojis. Am I eating watermelon? Sure, why not? OK. So there, there's that. Now go into another browser window. Do that. Delete this thing. Go over here. So this is a persistent application. OK, so you may be thinking, OK, that's not that exciting. No real smoke or mirrors there. So let's close this. Let's close this. Let's actually create a new instance of the browser. Uh, let's go over here. Okay, just creating a new in private. Let's browse to there. 404 not found. But what on earth? This is the exact same URL that I used before, and now it's saying that it doesn't exist. The reason is there's some ridiculous smoke and mirrors going on. There's actually a um, there's actually a service worker that is intercepting requests and it's proxying them to an ASP.NET Core server that is being hosted out of a browser tab. So yeah, so this is, and he says on here, don't actually do this. This is a horrible idea. It is a proof of concept to show this is actually running entire ASP.NET application in a browser tab um, hosted in WASI. So you wouldn't do this. What you would use WASI to do is actually, and Steve goes into it in, in his presentation, there are um, hosting systems out there actually 
focusing on can we build an entire ecosystem with packages and hosting, et cetera. Um, Azure has, has some support for this. And hosting, instead of using Docker or in addition to using Docker, hosting in, um, in instead using, here in just a second, I'm looking to see if I have this. There's a really cool post on this yesterday. I'll dig it out of my tweets. Somebody went into detail about um, WebAssembly and where it's going and what the future is. And WASI is definitely uh, an interesting part of that. So my main point here is there's nothing that you'll use here today. This is just a random crazy thing. But it is also a thing where it's like, uh, it makes me happy to see that the team is focusing on this very future focused stuff. Here I found my link here. I'll bring this up. This is this is not you know Microsoft person at all. In fact, he doesn't even mention Blazor in here, but he does talk about WebAssembly and WASI, et cetera. This helped me kind of wrap my mind around it. So the idea here is um, the team is continuing to look at where WebAssembly can take us in the future. I think at that, I have some wrap-up slides and I'll take a few questions going on. Yeah, there's this um, this WASI SDK if you want to play with that. Um, so that's cool. Man, Sean is killing it on looking up the um, the links really quickly. Thanks, Sean. If there's one um, thing I've learned, it's how to Google things quickly, Jeff. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, um, that post, uh, you know, I've been following WebAssembly stuff for a while. Um, I felt like he did a really good job in this post about talking about what it is and taking it from beyond kind of just general hype stuff to like why it's why it's super interesting. There's also just you know like some very cool stuff or some useful information here. He links to a postmortem for a, from a team that was like WebAssembly is the future. It actually didn't work for their use cases. So it's it's a neat new thing. There's a huge amount of um, possibility, but it's also something where it's, you know, it's, you got to figure out where it fits in. I'm happy that people like Steve are figuring that out for me. Cool. Let's, let's roll way, way back. ASP.NET Core highlights. Um, we've got minimal APIs. We've got minimal templates all around, um, but especially minimal APIs. That's something that um, as I'm building new APIs, this is where I'm starting with. Uh, you don't have to use them. You can continue to use API controllers if you want, but it's it's, it's nice to see them implemented in .NET 6 and then a lot of the future things they're building in for .NET 7. Hot reload, basically all the time I always run with .NET Watch now. And it's it's one of those things where it doesn't always work, but it, a lot of the time it does and it, it makes me quite happy. Um, the integration with front-end JavaScript frameworks, I am... I think that that is going to be super useful over the long term, um, and I, I think it's it's a much kind of clearer model for you know like just an integration with those um, this nice kind of separation. It's something that I already saw developer teams doing manually. They would create their API, then they would create their Angular project, and they just point them at each other, <laughs> and that's actually what this is doing kind of now. So, and then amazing things going on with Blazor. Um, we are using it. A, a, a lot at Microsoft. There are some case studies and things uh, that we've got on the .NET website. It is something where it is relatively new, um, but it is nice that WebAssembly in general is broadly supported across browsers and there's a huge momentum behind it. And then also exciting for me that it's enabling some new things, um, like I talked about towards the end with uh, Blazor um, Maui Hybrid, and then also with uh, WASI stuff going forward. Stuff in the works in .NET 7, you can continue to follow, of course, on the blog and then on that roadmap I pointed out. Um, as always, like I, I continue to, to plug this .NET community stand up. I am super biased because I'm, you know, help run it. But honestly, I, I just feel like it's such a great connection to, um, to the team and to the community. We had a great one on today where Damian Bowden taught me a ton of stuff about OpenID Connect and and OAuth uh, flows and, and implementing them with ASP.NET Core and stuff. So um, this is a great way to kind of dig deeper into just about anything. For instance, I showed three minutes about gRPC transcoding. James talked for an entire hour on it um, on May 10th, as you can see there. So um, definitely, uh, this is my one of the few ways where I'm able to kind of keep up with what's going on with ASP.NET 
in general. And so this is my kind of secret tool for, for uh, how I keep up to date. That's all I got. Um, so I am I am done there. I I am happy for any questions. Hope I hope that was it. it's it's just a ton of stuff. <laughs> no, it, it was I was awesome. I think we we we've definitely had some feedback. Lots of love for you in the chat, uh, folks. Really enjoying all of the information. And I agree. You know, I I like to think that I follow this stuff reasonably well. Um, and you know, there's just so much cool stuff happening that it is it is really drinking drinking from the fire hose. And so like. The, I think that you're at community stand-up links, the different places where you can kind of plug in and sort of dip dip your toe in and get the latest information and then duck back out when, when you need to. I think those are just awesome resources that the team is putting together. So uh, really, really happy to see those out there. Um, awesome. I'm looking to see if we've got comments. I think you may have managed to answer an entire YouTube audience's worth of, of, com <laughs> of questions here because I don't see too many questions popping in. Um, and I'm just looking at the, the chat to make sure I haven't missed anything. Oh, there was a question, and I think you spoke to it um, for you know whether folks love Blazor or not. Um, have mm -hmm. you seen adoption across the ecosystem? I know, like you mentioned, it's not going to work for everyone's use cases, and I'm not sure if you spoke to this specifically. But are you seeing it trend upward, or do you kind of find it sort of in the early adopter experimental stages in the larger industry so far? Yeah, it's so it is kind of interesting. You know, we we do see some. There's definitely. Um, uh, we're always looking, and, and anyone you know watching that that is actually developing production Blazor apps, we do like to get case studies up on the site. Um, so this is something where, if I go up on here, if we go to .net, um, we do have some. Case, actually, this is a site where I or, um, I helped update this recently. If we go to who uses .net, so we do have a few here listed on Blazor. Um, we definitely use it a decent amount internally at Microsoft as well. Um, and then these are ones, there's a, a ton of others we know about, but as, as far as ones where they'll, they'll actually say, hey, here, we'll work with you and write a whole case study and we can you know, talk about it publicly, et cetera. Those are, those are some of the kind of main ones. Um, it's kind of interesting because it is a browser standard thing. I don't know how obvious it is you know, if an application is actually using Blazor. Um, for instance, like you wouldn't necessarily know that this part of the website is using Blazor, but the rest isn't. Um, and that's also another kind of neat case is you don't have to build an entire application in Blazor. You can actually integrate the two together. So we have um, the .NET website and the Blazor application. It just pulls in some components. We're actually splitting this up over time to make it easier to create just one-off components that will just plug in through the site. So that kind of, that whole like islands of interactivity sort of thing is, um, is you know, a thing there. But yeah, it's it's definitely kind of a newer fringer thing. It's also WebAssembly in general is something that we're continuing to see um, built out more. It's interesting um, as mentioned in here, there's some cool cases where like, for instance, like. Photoshop and Autodesk Web are being delivered using WebAssembly. So I mean, there's there's a huge amount of like opportunity for it, and I think it's going to just continue to be being built out more over time. So. Great. Yeah, so I don't I don't see any other uh, questions in the chat. So I'll give folks one last opportunity to post. I'll ask you: Do you have any parting advice for for Developers, you know, our our DC .NET devs who are who are doing this development work day in and day out. Any parting uh, words of words of insight or something that you you would offer them in, in terms of uh, their their careers and, and how they're doing development these days? Wow. Um, okay, so I feel like, and this kind of goes against a lot of what I just showed. You don't have to chase all the newest shiny stuff. I think that having this kind of balance between what's available and what you actually use is nice. So I, I tend to keep a lot of stuff in my general awareness bucket and kind of sort of keep up with it and then dig in deep uh, as time goes. Um, so, so that's kind of my, my um, high level recommendation. I would recommend to, um, we're doing a ton of stuff like on, um, uh, so just on the um, Microsoft Learn, for instance, um, 
we've got some like, for instance, events, we've got some things. Uh, I was I was just on this one yesterday, but then we also do these Let's Learn events. Um, we also have been putting some time into, and, and I'm curious and, and would be happy for any feedback about what could be better, um, but we're building these learning paths around .NET. So for instance, there was one we built just recently, uh, Cam Soper built out this whole thing on um, identity and demystifying some of the stuff with identity. So I, I actually do want to answer, um, uh, Rishi asked a question of Blazor and Silverlight. And I think that, that is a fair, decent question. There's some huge differences between Silverlight and Blazor, but it's not super obvious at the beginning. Um, and the, um, the thing is that Silverlight was an amazing hack that ran C Sharp in the browser. So that's the part where they seem similar. What's different about them is Silverlight was not a browser standard, right? And WebAssembly is a browser standard. It's ported everywhere. Um, I remember I have blog posts about how to get Silverlight running in Firefox version, blah, 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 because you know it was a plugin and it required people to install a browser plugin to even work. So what's, what's nice is we don't need anyone's permission um, to make you know, Blazor work. Um, and for instance, when, you know, Steve Jobs said no flash, no plugins, whatever on iOS devices, that was kind of a big part of the end of Silverlight, right? Whereas now uh, it'll kind of run anywhere. And then also with Blazor server, it actually can run, like it'll run anywhere you got a browser basically, right? So I think that's really the main sort of difference. I feel like, um, I feel like because it's running built on browser standards, it's not running this kind of uphill battle that was in the past. So, um, so that's kind of my thoughts on, on you know, Blazor on Blazor versus Silverlight in general. Yeah, similar similar feeling of magic, but the ecosystem and the context is caught up a little bit to to where it can be uh, a little bit have a bit more longevity. I think you're you're totally right. Yeah, um, exactly. So you know, I'll say, John, always a really great, great pleasure having you having you on. I, I appreciate you making the time to to talk to us all here and and rounding it out with with a huge amount of awesome information. Um, so really, just the can't can't thank you enough for making the time and the space for us tonight. And and really um, hope to have you back on at some point. And and uh, you know, we'll certainly be tracking you in the community. And uh, I'm sure uh, for all the devs it is you. Know, if you haven't seen uh, John around, that's his Twitter handle there. Uh, as, is that your GitHub as well? Is that all your the, all the handles? Kind of everything is just yeah. about everywhere. Yeah. So so be sure to be sure to follow John. He's always in the midst of all his cool stuff, and and also as you've seen tonight, remarkably nice guy. So John, thanks thanks for taking the time. Really appreciate it. And uh, I haven't seen any other questions come in, so I think with that we'll we'll let you get back to your day, and uh, and we'll say thank you and good night to everyone here at .NET DC. So um, just to to wrap up real quick for those of you who are are interested, don't forget to to check out Meetup uh, or the .NET DC YouTube channels or GitHub. We're trying to be all out there as well. So and next month actually to build on some of what John talked about tonight. I think next month, we haven't officially announced it yet, but sneak preview for the group. We've got a, a presentation on how to package up your JavaScript apps and deploy them with Maui. So we should 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 be a pretty good one uh, uh, coming up as well. So we're going to do a collaboration with the Angular DC user group on that. So looking forward to, to seeing you all, hopefully, for next month's meeting. And John, thank you, as always, for your time. And, and we really appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. All right. All right. With that, we'll bid you good evening. Thanks, everyone. And good night.